booths and that sort of thing. So the retailers and tenants are spending less to promote because they're expanding less than they used to be. They're not building as much. Um, so what does that mean for us? A lot of us know here in Tatsby, we're very data-driven. I'm very data-driven. Um, we continue to use that approach. We continue to build those relationships. They're going to pay off in a few years. Nothing happens the very next day after you go have a meeting. It takes three, four years to develop these relationships with people. And then when the time is right, they will think about your community. Um, and we're also working to fill a lot of commercial availabilities as well. Um, it's funny that I said on this slide, and then I got like this hotel group reached out randomly and said, we want to be in Las Vegas. I'm like, oh, okay, well, I guess my commercial thing is not quite right, but uh, it's good. There's still some stuff, there's still some opportunity out there, but the opportunity are less, are, are less than they had in the past. So what we're doing though, especially on our data side, is I want to share this example. I'll use the, the, the name Tire Provider X. So I called Tire Provider X the other day, I said, hey, I want to meet you in Las Vegas. The city could use a full service tire store. And they said, eh, you know, you guys are a little small for us. Unless you can do something to kind of change our performa. And I'm like, all right, mission, mission, uh, mission accomplished or accepted here. Let's make that happen. So what I did, using some of our data stuff, is I went into the Bakersfield market, for example, and I searched tires. We use Placer AI. And I pulled up all these tire stores in Bakersfield. You can see some of them listed over here. And I went, and through our Placer AI data, we can find out what zip code these people are from. So I ran reports on all these stores and found all the 93561s, all the Taft Beach trade area, all the city of Taft Beach trade area. And I put them on a sheet. And then I put them in a, uh, and I also did the same for the Antelope Valley for Lancaster Palmdale stores because of the California City and Mojave addresses that shop into Taft regularly for tire services, either doesn't go that way necessarily in here. Uh, there are that Bakersfield, so I pulled those on some of those stores. So as you can see, I mean, there's the kind of trade area people are like 46, 47,000, and I even added it, and I'll show you on the next slide, the tire store, which is outside of the city, on Highway 202. So what that was able to do was to show the tire store's numbers. I created geofence around them, out there in the county, they're like 37,000 visits a year, which is actually, you average that out, that's higher than some of the tire shops in Bakersfield, some of these giant discount chains and whatnot. So then I was able to take all this data, including the visit numbers, send it back to our friends at Tire Brand X, and they said, oh, okay, I'd like to chat with you. So it's been able to use, especially in a tight market, to use data to try to tell your story a little bit better. So that was certainly a success story. Uh, next thing that we're doing is uh, we are working with this group called MapMe. Um, and what MapMe does is it is an interactive map. So I've got a retail avails map, but I have an approved residential map. And so it's interactive. I can have it on my iPad. I can click on a project. I'm going to pull up some renderings. I can upload documents, um, you know, floor plans, all this stuff, because uh, it's always good to have the data of what's available in your community at hand. Um, but a lot of these people, they want to know what's coming on the residential plan. Because they say, I don't have enough rooftops yet, what do you have? So I can go to these maps and I can show them. And I think, let's see if I can get one and actually pull up. Um, let's see if we can see if we can the Wi Fi. Oh, man. So this is the, uh, the city residential map. And so I can go to anything like this Pinion, uh, let's see, Pinion 96 condo project. Click on that, and I've got an artist rendering, you know, which is a nice, pretty picture, and you know, the site design is there as well. Um, and so I can show these things to these folks all across, and, and really, really quickly as well, so they can see the type of things that are coming into our community. And the same goes on the other side for the availability, availability map of whether it's maybe the retail avails at the new Starbucks, because there's a couple units available. And I was able to take this and then pull off of our real estate data co-star. So I have all this right at hand on following new papers and that sort of thing. And this is for every project and availability, whether it's a vacancy or Roger across the, uh, the city that's available. So this is the uh, data from them as well. So that's kind of what we're doing to capitalize on these opportunities and have a tighter market. And also, tighter market also means on the large front, it means a good opportunity for small businesses, rents come down, uh, availabilities, there's incentives, so it's an opportunity for small businesses to expand as well, uh, funding uh, notwithstanding. So that's kind of a uh, update from the city of Taxi. Any questions?
wonderful. Thank you guys. Now we're going to take the computer screen. Most of the talk is This is a walk and walk. Yay! There it is. So, I'm going into Richard, and I don't normally do this, so just bear with me. He, the first thing we're updating back on is PIC, a program that the foundation has teamed with, uh, MAP from PDC, and what it does is it works with interns from um, CTEC and ROC, and they're paid internships by a sponsorship from Bank of America, so we pay the intern, your company gets an intern for eight weeks, and then you don't have to pay them. You do have to board them as an employee, but you don't have to pay them. They're part of this program. So you wanted me to show you this video. Does it have Yeah, sure.
the Willow Rock Energy Storage Center at 500 <coughs> megawatt by eight hour battery, if you will, mechanical battery. I provided an update to this group uh, a couple months back, and I thought I'd just give a quick update on how things are proceeding. Our site, again, over the hill, just down to Hatchby Willow Springs Road and Hamilton Road. We're on the opposite view, or on the same view, on the opposite side of the Willow Springs Raceway. The, uh, the project, we completed three boreholes over the last, well, end of last year, early this year. We're currently evaluating those boreholes and designing the project, going through the California Energy Commission process to license the project for construction. It's a very elaborate process to receive those permits. Uh, we expect those permits to be received later next year and advancing that project nicely for uh, operations later, end of this decade, 2028-2029. Uh, it's a billion plus dollar project. It has a peak workforce of 700 workers. The uh, average workforce of about 300 workers over about a four and a half year construction phase. So it's a very significant project for Kern County and for our, our company. It will be, again, the largest energy storage facility in North America, and we're very excited to be here in Kern County advancing this project. We also have a, uh, a drill break up over off of Highway 14 and Don Road, north of Rosemont, and we're assessing that for another additional site here in Kern County. So, real excited to be here. Uh, obviously, energy, energy is one of the uh, principal strong points in Kern County, and with all the intermittent renewable solar PV and wind. Those are great when they're running, but what we're gonna be able to do is take that off-peak power at night when the wind's blowing, or the, in the morning when the sun's shining and the load's not up, be able to store that excess energy in the form of mechanical battery, if you will, and use that for peak periods late in the afternoon, early evening, when the sun goes down and the wind stops uh, overall, California needs about 11,000 megawatts have been mandated for new storage, and we're a small chunk of that at 500 megawatts, but it's an important part, and we're very excited to be here. Again, if uh, folks are interested, happy to chat with you more, or visit our website, hydrostore.ca. So, thanks for your time. I have a question. How do you dig those vaults? We, uh, I don't want to get too uh, into details, just given time constraints. There is a four minute video on YouTube. Just put HydroStore in there and it'll describe our technology. It's called Advanced Compressed Air Energy Storage. Does it show how to dig the vaults? We, uh, we utilize a blind bore shaft technique. We drill eight foot diameter bore holes down to 2,000 feet depth where we construct underground caverns. In the oh, I see. So it's a uh, very extensive process. It sounds mysterious, but these uh, techniques have been used for over 100 years to construct underground caverns, proven in operation. And there are videos on YouTube as well for blind bore shaft drilling. Again, it's a eight, eight foot diameter uh, shaft that we deconstruct mining equipment send it down the shaft, reconstruct it down a couple thousand feet, and do traditional mining techniques to excavate our caverns. And do you uh, put something on the inside to keep the air from going back out? I didn't bring my uh, granite core. I, I rarely leave home without it. Uh, <laughs> what, what we see is airtight, watertight formations, typically uh. granite. And that's what we found here. That's why we're here. Um, without an airtight, watertight cavern, we don't have a project. There will be likely some modest grouting that will put into fractures in the rock formation, but we don't intend to line it. It's, it's granite, it holds water, it holds air. Thank you. Once the, uh, construction is complete, how many jobs, full-time jobs do you expect to have? We expect 25 to 40 full-time O&M positions to operate the facility, and that's not counting all the other uh, non-related, uh, 
position. And the city tax rate will have a zero for office. <laughs> <laughs> we'll need to talk. Hey, yeah. <laughs> I'll show you my maps. Right after you we'll get on a tire score. <laughs> Is the second site the same size, 500 megawatts? You said you're exploring the second site? That is a uh, open question right now, quite honestly. We have our first borehole, we just completed it. We're very encouraged by it. We need additional uh, triangulation of the formation to see how big a cavern we can make and at what depth. It's kind of a, a formula that we use. The deeper we can go, the smaller we can make the facilities at a higher pressure. So those sorts of calculations are, are going to be dependent on our geologic results. And, and, well, I think the, the benefit was this additional generating or storage capacity doesn't require any additional transmission lines because you're going to use the lines for, you're just storing off-peak energy to be used during on-peak, so you don't need any more transmission lines for your additional uh, generating capacity. We'll need to interconnect our new facility into the, existing the World Wind substation, which is at 170th and Rosemont Boulevard. And the most difficult thing to do to develop any power plant in California or the United States is to find transmission capacity where you can plug in new plants. We have uh, 500 megawatts of deliverability at the World Wind, which is very important. So. Um, we will require about an 11 mile new transmission line. Oh. Uh, but that. Uh, that's nothing. Th yeah, that's relatively modest. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and next we have NASA. Armstrong. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Go, Megan, go. Mount Gold at a time. <laughs> <laughs> I saw some of you the other day uh, on Tuesday at the chamber meeting, yeah, so nice to see some of your faces again. Really, I really was just here to listen, but um, uh, I was roped into an update, so I'm going to give you a short and sweet. A couple of things for our community college partners. Uh, NASA has the NASA Community College Aerospace Scholarship Program that just opened. Um, it's a three-mission uh, opportunity for college, community college students to walk through like each mission is five weeks long five weeks long and they learn all about NASA. It's a great career pathways program. Um, so if you have community college students, uh, pass that along if you need the information just holler. Uh, the other thing, the exciting thing is that we've got the X59, some of you heard all about that. Uh, we anticipate that that will roll out this summer uh, down at Lockheed Skunk Works down in Pondo. So stay tuned for more about that. Happy to share info on that. Um, we're doing lots of advanced air mobility work. We're talking a lot about this with our uh, legislative partners because California has a ton of opportunity here. We're a unique uh, makeup. We have big cities. We also have lots of open space. And Ohio and Texas are really trying to rule the market. So uh, for those of you who consider economic development, just kind of make a note in the back of your mind that Advanced air mobility, which is like air taxis, is a good thing to consider. Uh, NASA is doing a ton of work in that space, so just something to kind of tuck away. And then a uh, quick plug for Artemis, which is our mission. So if you don't know, we are going back to the moon. Um, Kern County actually has three suppliers that were part of the Artemis One mission. Um, I think that tends to surprise people, but just re you know, just remember that uh, we all have businesses around here that are part of that bigger mission. Um, if you have something that your business you think offers or could offer NASA, please reach out and we'll connect you. Uh, we are thinking about doing a small business workshop on how you connect with NASA uh, to bring your business in. And that's it. Any questions? Anything you guys need? All right. Next up is Tom County. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Once again, my name is Laura Lynn Wyatt. I'm the District Director for Kern County Supervisor Zach Scrivener. Um, so I have a couple things to touch on today for this group. Uh, the last time the City of Tehachapi hosted this meeting, Supervisor Scrivener did a report on the um, grant funding, almost $9 million into park improvements. 
And I'm here to report that those projects are happening. We are very, very busy in East Kern. I just did a site visit this morning in Rosemond. Um, I spoke to the uh, gentleman there that were, they were pouring the brand new uh, decking. They said they've got about two days of concrete pour left. Uh, and then we'll be putting the final touches on that swimming pool. It will be open this summer and it will be open for the community. Um, we are hiring lifeguards and they have to go through Red Cross certification. I was told we need 15 lifeguards in order to be open seven days a week. So we are really pushing on social media and Mojave, Roselawn, and Palm Del Lancaster area trying to get those lifeguards hired so that we can be open every day. The park that's off of Glendower uh, is getting a brand new skate park. That skate park is in final design phase and will go out to bid soon. Uh, they are in the permitting process right now for some new parking stalls and walkways to get from the parking lot to the skate park and things like that. Uh, and we are also working on Boron, the county-owned park in Boron. They are rehabbing the community facilities. Yes, Mary Beth loves when I say Boron. I just say Boron, Boron, and she just cheers every time I say it. It's so easy. Uh, so we're rehabbing that, that building, um, all new flooring, new paint, new, new kitchenette area. Uh, there's a group out there, a nonprofit group called Boron Alive. And they will be sort of administering and, and the keeper of the keys, if you will, for that building. Make sure it's locked up at night, people clean up after themselves, things like that. The park where that building is located is also getting a splash pad that is in design phase and another skate park that's in design phase. Uh, so we are we're very, very busy. Uh, the, the grant money became available, which is a blessing, but then all of a sudden you're like, ooh, we need the manpower and the resources to pull off these projects. So uh, we're Public Works Department and General Services in the county are very, very busy. But it's exciting stuff, so I wanted to give you an update on that. Uh, update regarding the Mojave Inland Port. Um, Pioneer Partners, that is the group that's doing that project, that is estimated to bring about 300 jobs to the region. Uh, they are currently in Sacramento. Uh, they are applying for transportation grant funding from the state. And the idea behind that is to, uh, they, there's two places where the rail traffic is going to be increased. And there's two places where the, where the trains cross, right? One is Business 58 in Mojave, and the other is Rosemont Boulevard going out to the base and that beautiful new museum that, that Rex is referring to. So, uh, you know, there's some egress and, and, and work that's going to need to be done at those two locations so that we don't have traffic and transportation issues. So Pioneer Partners is working on that. They do have a website. You can go to uh, Mojave Inland Port and you can sign up to get uh, updates through email and newsletter if you'd like to do that. Just be careful, Google wants to take you to the, inland, the air and space port. To make sure you're clicking on the right thing. <laughs> um, and last but not least, uh, there will be a lot more conversation going on about this, uh, but the county is taking a look at a carbon capture and a carbon capture business park. Uh, so if you go to currentplanning.com, they have developed a very interactive website that you can go to and, and learn kind of what that looks like and what the county is proposing. And uh, that's estimated to bring about 700 jobs to, to the county. So uh, that's all I have unless there's questions for me. No questions? Yeah. Yeah, so you mentioned um, the park improvement projects. I know that uh, the county owns the Country Club Park and Leroy Jackson Park in Ridgecrest. I talked to Joe a little bit about it. Is there any update on like timelines or what those? That is definitely a Joe question because that is out of our district. So I'm not up to date with those, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yes, Heather. Yes, I thank you. Uh, they just surveyed that. Um, they surveyed it, and just marking underground utility lines, um, flood channel areas, things like that. Um, that is uh, also just in design phase right now. It's pretty preliminary, it's pretty far out when we're going to see dirt moving there. That's it. Okay, thank you very much.
Well, <laughs> you get to be everything. Boron. Mary Beth. You're boron. You're, you're boron, you're boron, boron for sure. I'll be boron. I just like it. You're definitely <laughs> boron. Um, I'm going to stand right back here. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's hot. It finally got hot in boron. And so the temperature went from like the high in the 80s to 98 in one day. So now everyone's like whining. No, air conditioning, what's going on? Anyway, we're doing good though. Um, I just want to give an update on our newest project, which is the Poslin project, which is super cool. We're taking hundreds year old mine waste and we're just doing a little roasting and we are making a product that will go into cement. And so it will be lend, and we are working with a company called Sierra Minerals. They are our partners. And uh, we are going to be building that processing center on our site, on our existing footprint. And you guys, it extends the mine life for decades because we have decades of mine waste. So they'll be taking that and making it into a product that all of us use every day, concrete. So um, it's pretty exciting for us. We're very excited. Uh, we continue to uh, we continue to talk about lithium. As you know, we've extracted lithium from our mine waste as well, and uh, we are working to fully implement that at the highest degree of level. And it is with Rio Tinto, our parent company, and they went to. We were thinking small; they're thinking big. So we hope to have more on that in the coming days. Um, other than that, we're just continuing to mine um, the minerals you guys use every single day. Anyone have any questions? Oh, oh wait a minute, one more thing. The pool opens to the public for the first time, June 5th, and we are gonna make it big.
uh, upsetting uh, incident you know, last week with um, uh, four homicides. Um, very, you know, it's actually rather unusual for Mojave to have that much, you know, violence. Um, we have graffiti, but we don't usually have people um, killing each other. So, at any rate, but that's Mojave's Mojave, and we're grateful for any any help anybody can give us. Thank you. Date, which was great. So about the only thing I have to report about is a recycled water plant cost us $15 million is working. It's fully optional, operational, and it's pumping water back into the water for aquifer. So that means Roseland can get credit, can pump more water now after the adjudication. So we're happy about it. There was five teams. They had to develop a whole idea, what it was going to look like. They had a whole plan of marketing, and this, these ones, there were three girls that won this one from the C-Tech, and they actually changed their plan last minute, but it's what won. Senior of Old School, currently uh, attending robotics engineering at CTEC. 
And that's one of the things that you kind of learn in this class, uh, just given the kind of thing you do here, but especially programming, is you learn problem solving and like, critical thinking skills. They have the Google robots, which are a type of industrial robot. They have universal robots, which are a type of collaborative robot, meaning they are meant to work directly uh, with people and directly around people. This program is unique in that it explores mobile industrial robots, industrial robotic arms, collaborative robots, and the universal robot, where students uh, receive multiple certificates. And my name is Stephen Mears. I teach robotics engineering here at the Career Technical Education Center in Kern County. The robots are like paint. As an artist, if you just encounter paint, one person might paint the mountains, and then another person might paint portraits. And so it's really up to one's creativity and how they explore and express themselves with that technology. And the only way to really do that is to work with people, um, get one-on-one -on -one with them, and see how best to address their issues with the tools that we've given them. Today should be pretty exciting because we're going to Mojave and Students to success 
not simply to a job, not simply to a school, but wants a pathway every student to uh, a successful place in society. It does say members. Can a guest talk? I think that's the same. Yes. Oh, thank you. <laughs> He's been waiting for this. I've been waiting all yeah. day for oh. this, according to Danny Bassell. Uh, uh, and Danny knows me. Uh, I don't want to let the moment go to waste. The Flight Test Museum Foundation is, uh, came up with a major fall, and that was exhibited on our very first pre presenter when the city of Tasby talked about inflation. We had. Uh, you know, everything we could possibly do to build the museum, and we did our the environmental impact statement was huge, very expensive, time consuming. We graded the site. We, uh, if you take which one of these, this tells what the, we're planning for the flight test museum. I, I got one. You, Danny, you would pass that down. I don't. I think I have enough. If you can pass those around and. This is the basic information. I only thought there'd be about 30 people here instead of what, 50? This is awesome for Patrick. Uh, I'm, in, I'm an expert. I, uh, I live in San Diego, so that means I live over 50 miles away, and I did bring a briefcase. So that's the definition of an expert, right? <laughs> you know, and when you go out and pay those big bucks, but I'm free. Uh, I retired from Edison, Southern California Edison Company in 1993 for 36 years. And I was the operations manager up here in Tashby. And I still have two daughters and a son that live here out of my, all of my 12 children, three of them are still here in Tashby. Uh, I'm very productive, by the way. Uh, the, uh, I like to look at the brochures. We need all the help we can. We, if we have 75,000 foot structure that it's erected. The metal looks beautiful, the framing, and all it lacks is a metal siding, a roof, and a hangar door. And that's the cost of inflation to get that done is $1.2 million. So uh, the hangar door with the loan is $350,000. So what we are in the process of doing over the next six months is raising $1.2 million by asking 1,200 of our commercial, industrial, individual partners in all three counties. Edwards Air Force Base is 300,000, 303,000. Acres? 305,000 acres. 419. 419,000 <laughs> acres. 419,000 acres? Did you farm more land than no, these? No, 418 square miles, sorry. 418 square miles, 300,000 acres. Yeah. <laughs> Danny is representing Edwards Air Force Base. So, uh, we, uh, it's in all three counties, the territory of Edwards. The majority of it is in our county, it's in Kern County. We get a tremendous economic benefit from it. We have a threefold reason for the Flight Test Museum. One is we want to promote Edwards Air Force Base. If we in Kern County did not have Edwards Air Force Base, which generates $1.2 trillion per year, no, no, no. we would be going out spending hundreds of thousands of dollars to secure it. So let's spend a few dollars trying to maintain the image so when the Florida folks, or if somebody else wants to take our missions and move it away from Edwards, which they have done in a few past, we can say this is the premier spot for a flight test facility. That's number one. By having a flight test museum, we broadcast that. Two, we have 80 of the historic aircraft that you can actually touch and feel, but they're in storage, they're hidden all over Edwards, nobody has access to them. We want to expose that to the world, and it's a worldwide attraction. Within about five years, if you go Google the top 10 flight museums in the world, uh, three of them are in the United States, in Europe and the rest are in the United States. They're all small, but except for Wright-Patterson Air Force Base and of course the Smithsonian and Washington. We want to make this like, I want to make this the third or fourth. I want you to, we're gonna, it's gonna be great for the tourist industry. It'd be great to maintain Edwards. 
And then the third and final goal that every one of us has to do, because I have a very large family, this will inspire future generations to go after science, technology, engineering, and math, because the museum itself is going to be a flight test museum and STEM exhibit area. We're dedicating an awful lot of space to STEM, and every exhibit will give credit to what uh, science, technology, engineering, math played in there. So we need to come <coughs> to It's not a one-person effort. You can't believe how 1,200 of our business friends that uh, can benefit by this, by uh, becoming a life friend of the Flight Test Museum, it's $1,000. You get permanent recognition on an interest in the museum, and you get some little, some few other perks. But the idea is basically we get this museum built because it needs to be built. We deserve to have it, and we need your help. And just to, we're not asking a lot from one person; we're just asking a lot of people just to give a little bit. And that thousand dollar pledge could be paid over three years if you're an individual. If you're a major corporation, we accept your ch check. And some major corporations have stepped forward and organizations at 15 to 25 to 50,000 because to get 1.2 million dollars in the next six months we need all of us working together thank you for your patience and i apologize for taking up your time okay. so you're stuck in the yeah some of you i haven't met yet uh, i'm jim service i'm the chief operating officer for kern county so i, I got stuck in a there's an accident on the 58 and i was been here on time maybe a couple others also um, so I know Teresa Hitchcock used to be more involved with this group. Teresa has moved on from the county, and so uh, I'm going to be a little more involved going forward. So uh, if I haven't met you yet, I'd love to do that. Do my part. Uh, Laura Lynn did a great job of kind of talking about some of the projects going on. I will come more prepared in the future. Uh, I wasn't really prepared to, to share so uh, today, but uh, happy to do that in the future. And uh, again, if there's any questions or anything I can help you with or you need to contact with the county, I'll let me know while I'm here and, and we'll be sure to connect with you. So. We can Thanks. start again. We'll start again. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then Tim, thank you. And Tim from the Mojave Spaceport, I don't think you were here when we introduced everybody or yeah oh, sorry guys I, I was dealing with business call my, my apologies yeah now Tim Reed is the uh, Mojave Spaceport general manager so welcome anybody else what are you doing? I'm not even short of the meeting I thought I was in charge of the meeting as we walked in <laughs> but I'm done. Uh, so let's see uh, when Richard and I and a couple others started this kind of this coalition many years ago, this is exactly what I had envisioned, right? So that we could all in East Kern get together and compare notes. The opportunities, the challenges, those sorts of things. IPR, hospitals, all the different things that we've talked about. Uh, one of the things that I want to make uh, everyone aware of is that Kern County Superior Courts, no, it's not Kern County, yeah. it is uh, the state of California. But they're looking to potentially consolidate. Claudia, you wrote an article about this about a year ago, where Zach Scrivener and I, uh, second district supervisor and the city of Tatchby, went on record opposing this. And what we were opposing was that currently there are two courts in Eastern Kern, one in the city of Ridgecrest and one in the community of Mojave. The current superior courts, county of Kern, is looking to consolidate and or potentially close those, right? And we want each other to be healthy, right? In our communities, that's why we're together. Uh, and so they're moving down this road rather quickly. The city of Tehachapi and the city of Ridgecrest, Ron Strand, my colleague, he's the city manager over there, we put a stop to this and said, you can't do this behind closed doors. You need to have some public meetings. Because if you're going to consolidate and or close Ridgecrest and or close Mojave and consolidate to Tehachapi, I don't like the sound of that. I'm not looking to rob others of resources. I'm looking for East Kern to be healthy. And so we need to get engaged. There's going to be a couple of public meetings, we're told, Bakersfield, Tehachapi, and Ridgecrest at this point. More to come, film at 11. But keep your keep your ears open for this. Um, the state had already approved certain things, and we got them to stop and potentially relook at this. So.
they've gone down the road quite far already. So just keep your ears open and we'll let you know through Claudia and maybe our social media uh, what we find out and when we find this out. Any questions, sir? Yes. I just want to ask you, please make sure that California City is also involved or, you know, is aware because what you're saying, the first thing my head's saying, oh my God, what's this going to do to our law enforcement? We're going to lose Well, I can imagine if you're living in Ridgecrest and you have to come to Tashby for court, that's not fair, right? If you're living in Roseman or Boron, you go to Mojave and, the, you know. Anyway, it's a big problem. I, I understand consolidation. I understand the goals potentially, but the clients are East Kern, not just to hatch. And and so I'm not all. I'm not about consolidating into Hatchby and robbing. We're not even robbing. We're not even supporting this. Let's be clear. We're not supporting this. I just. I'm thinking East Kern. These kind of decisions mm -hmm. affect all of us. So let's have yeah. a conversation. Follow the city attached to on our social media. <laughs> Read the text. Do I have to pay for your podcast? I looked yesterday and they said I have to pay $17 a month. No. No. It's for the month. How do I get it? Well, you have a podcast. <laughs> Award winning. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions for, <laughs> for me or Tax Free? Thank you. Oh, by the way, the new winery across the street, straight in. Like a hundred feet from here, <laughs> they opened at three. Yeah. <laughs> so after the screen, we'll see you all over there, right? <laughs> hey, Greg, uh, um, I'm a new resident to Hatchby, and I just wanted to give you guys a compliment. Um, I was walking my dog on Sunday morning, and the police officer actually made eye contact with me and waved. <laughs> I was like, where, where the hell am I? <laughs> Thank you. Did he use his whole hand? Yeah. <laughs> let, me, let me make one correction. Uh, they laughed at me when I he corrected me. It wasn't one point three trillion dollars. I just attended the public hearing in Barstow about two weeks ago, and the the Burlington Northern and Santa Fe Railroad Company just announced a one point three trillion dollar project in Barstow. They've already purchased the twelve sections of land, 12 times 640 acres, from uh, Linwood, west five miles, from the old highway past the Mojave River. So it's a $1.3 trillion, and a project that big is gonna have a very positive impact on Dashby, because they're gonna be looking for a lot of people. It's a completely automated uh, uh, transfer of equipment, everything coming from the ports of Long Beach and LA on railroads instead of trucks on 20, 20 foot containers to the Barstow yard, transferred automated with all kinds of robotic equipment from those uh, railroad cars to other railroad cars into the 40 foot containers and also go back on the trucks. It's tremendous for the economic benefit to the total area, cannot be understated. So $1.3 trillion there, and what are Danny told me about the uh, economic <laughs> impact of that? <laughs> Thank you for your patience. Oh, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, One old man to another. Hi, the other Josh Pierce. Uh, and uh, so Cornerstone this month, we're having our official grand opening. We've been open about a year. It is Mental Health Awareness Month. We do a lot of uh, substance abuse and mental health. Um, and part of our goal, um, and I was thinking of the last time I heard Greg speak, he talked about a catastrophe that thrives. So I began analyzing our program to see what does it look like to thrive. Um, and the majority of our clients who come in are often to have to be, and uh, they, most of them are living on the, on the system, they're on food stamps, they're getting state aid. And so one of our, one of our goals we've done is we look to graduate our first class of students um, or clients in the next coming months is all of them went, some of them went from being homeless, squatting, causing issues to have to now having their kids back in their life, having their own apartments, having a job, paying taxes, by putting themselves back in. So, but I think of what we do, it is also economic development. We do take people who are living off the system to uh, putting into the system. And so I invite you guys to come out. Uh, fentanyl has been hitting to have to be more and more. Um, and so the county's coming out to do uh, sponsored Narcan training. Uh, which is something that can save a life. Um, if you like cornhole, uh, we're also doing a cornhole tournament uh, next week as well. And it's just a time to gather, hear the program, hear from the clients, hear what they're doing. 
um, and kind of hearing kind of where we're looking to go with also be a ribbon cutting. I'm pretty stoked you know, about being able to cut a ribbon, not gonna lie. Um, it's been a dream of mine forever. Um, so I invite you guys to come out, um, hear what we're doing, get an art camp training. We'll be a distribution site, so if you need some, um, so that we can continue to save lives and continue to, uh, I mean, when I was a kid, I, you know, I rode my bike all over Tashkey. I know it doesn't look like I've ever ridden a bike, but I did. Um, and I want my nieces, who are four and two, to be able to do that safely as well. So, um, and that's part of what we do at Cornerstone.